I said, everybody, stand up. Stand up. The actual standing kind of stand. Like when you're, oh, it's, it's cold outside. We should, maybe we should have class. So I actually stand when I work. Uh, maybe we should have class like this. This would be kind of funny. Right? <laughs> this is weird. OK, sit down. <laughs> it would be weird if you guys were standing in the whole class. It would be kind of fun. All right, so it's cold outside. I uh, hope everybody had a nice long weekend. Hope the weather didn't ruin it for you. Um, we were here working on class stuff. That was fun. Um, unfortunately, we're still a little bit behind the eight ball with the class setup and everything. So if you think you're behind, uh, I think Sh uh, Sean talked to me before class and said he was, uh, you know, he was missing lecture notes and stuff like that. We're missing lecture notes too. That stuff will be online. I promise. Uh, that's all I've been working on for a couple of days. So so it's coming. Right. It's really. You wouldn't think it would be that hard, right? And you would think I would have done everything last year, but I don't know. I, I, decided, I decided to fix some things. Some of those things took longer than I wanted to, right? So today we're going to finish up the examples from last time, and then we're going to focus on um, getting through sort of process creation, right? Process life cycle, right? Where do processes come from? Uh, how, do new, how are new processes created? Uh, a little bit more on IPC along with some of this, and then how do, uh, how do processes die? Right? How do processes decide what they want to be in life? Right? So various stages in the life cycle of a process. And hopefully by the end of Friday, we're going to essentially show you how to write using Unix system calls just a really simple little shell. Right? Uh, you know, very, very basic, very basic, like three line uh, Unix command line shell. Um, this is the link again to sign up for the class email list. I think everybody is on this list at this point. How many people have not been getting emails about this class? OK, great. Uh-oh. There's always one thing I forget to do. Um, if you, well, everybody has. OK, great. And then are the issues, have the issues with Piazza resolved? Have pe people, have there been people who have been having a hard time getting on Piazza? I added everybody manually, so I think that works, right? The access code was broken for some reason. I've changed it several times. But Piazza doesn't seem to like it when I change the access code. So, um, OK. So we're going to try using Piazza. I'm going to have to you know, uh, remind the TAs and myself to check it. I don't you know, spend my life uh, on the internet reading bulletin boards like Piazza, so I'm going to have to get used to it. But uh, hopefully it's something that will be useful and allow us to sort of aggregate information. right? So uh, the, the bar for sending email to the staff list just went up a little bit. So if you send something to the staff list that I think is interesting and suitable for broader distribution, then we're going to ask you to, to put it on Piazza so other people can see the answer. We don't end up answering the same question multiple times. All right. Um, this is basically what I talked about. So we, we posted all the recitations in office hours. We have 27 hours of office hours a week scheduled. Uh, those were based on your times. They're scheduled so everybody can make at least one. Some of you guys only indicated two times in the entire week where you could come, so we did our best. Okay. And, and like somebody indicated two times, one of which was like Friday night from 8 to 9. Right? Um, not a time, not a popular time. Right? And not a time that the staff decided they wanted to hold office hours. So I don't even know why I put that up as an option. That was probably stupid on my part. Um, but yeah, so we have office hours. We're going to start today, I think, right after class. We have a shift, and then recitation will start today. Uh, my goal is still that Aditya can kind of walk you through some of the steps of getting your environment set up in today's recitation, but that requires me finishing a few things after class. So we'll see where we are. Um, all right, so when I was, uh, we talked a little bit about this before, but I just want to reiterate it as you guys get started on the programming assignment. So I don't have any interest in curving this class, so it looks like some of you guys learned and some of you didn't. If everybody finish the the finishes the assignments, then you guys are all going to do well, right? Um, when I was at Harvard, everyone talked about getting a grade, right? So how many people say, like, if you, I got to be in the class? Right? Is that how you would describe it? How many people would say that? You know, I got to be in that class, right? So when my advisor came to Harvard, he he talked about making an A, right? I thought that was it sounds very weird, right? Something like almost strange about, oh, I I made an A in the class, right? I don't I don't know. You feel, but that's how it is, right? Like I sound like I have a limited number of A's that I'm you know I have to I have to uh, quota here, right? I have to give out a certain number, or I can only give out a certain number, right? I can give it as many A's as I want to, right? I mean, if I gave the whole class an A, then I probably somebody would probably come and ask me if I was actually teaching a class or not. But if I had some good justification, like you guys all completed the assignments and did really well, then that would be fine, right? So there's no 
I, I like this. I came to like this terminology. I still don't like to say it, because I think it sounds weird. But, um, but that's really what's happening here, right? You guys are, I'm giving you guys a certain amount of choice as far as the grade you get. We're going to give you a lot of feedback, a lot of help, and hope that you guys can, can make it to that level, right? But, but there is no, grades are non-competitive. Right? This, is not a, this is not a thing. You guys should keep that in mind when you're using the stat resources on the website and stuff like that. You know, this, is, this is not a, a, a curved, you know, weeder, chem major, pre-med style class. All right? Like our goal is not to limit the number of people who get through the door. Our goal is to try to make everybody do well. Right? All right, and again, please use the Piazza forums for these sorts of questions. And help each other on Piazza, right? This is part of the point, you know? When, uh, when I took this class, there was a really great community of people in the class who were helping each other and posting questions and answering them. And you know, that's a really, uh, if, you, if you spend some time doing that, spend some time helping somebody with something, with a coding question or whatever, then I'm sure that that will sort of come back to you later in the class. And, and if, it, if it doesn't, then you'll just be seen as that real you know, incredible student who was so helpful and stuff like that. And that's not a, not a terrible reputation to have, right? I think that's something that most of us would, wouldn't mind. All right. so. Last time we had talked, we had started talking about process, processes, and now I just want to, I mean, at, at some point this all seems, starts to seem a little bit abrupt, right? At least to me. Um, but the problem is that, you know, there's some circularity going on here, and so this is our starting point, right? So we started talking about processes, sort of the, the, the basic operating system abstraction. Um, and today we're going to continue that discussion, and then we're going to talk a little bit about sort of how processes are born and die, right? But before I start, is there any questions about Friday? I know Friday was like a long, seems like a long time ago. Um, any questions about Friday? Anybody remember what we talked about Friday? That's discouraging. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll do some review in a minute. Uh, so, but first I want to finish the, uh, the example that we were working on when class finished that I think uh, sent you guys all off into a very dull, boring weekend, um, and then we'll then we'll do some review, and then we're going to keep going. All right, with some info stuff about file handles and the process creation. Okay. All right. So if if you remember when we finished on Friday, we were using Linux tools, standard Linux tools, to explore our our system. Right. So we were looking at information that we can find out from user space about uh, state that's maintained by the kernel about what other processes are doing. Right. So we used PS, right, to, uh, to show some information about Bash, and we discovered that Bash is single-threaded, right? Um, so we, we were building up this, this abstraction. We were starting to fill in um, some information about Bash based on this, this nice model that we had, right? Uh, who, who, can, uh, who wants to bring us back to Friday and tell us what, what, uh, what application we, uh, we used as an example of something that had multiple threads? Yeah? Web servers. web servers. What's your name? Unchul. The web server, right? Yep. So this is Apache, right? Apache had a bunch of threads, and we found out some information about them, and we talked about why, why Apache might have multiple threads, right? Why, why does Apache have multiple threads? I'm going to pick on somebody over here. Not someone without their hand up. Uh, why does Apache have multiple threads? To handle multiple, to multiple users. In this case, user is probably not the right word, but what does a web server handle? Well, requests. Yeah, there it is. All right, handle multiple requests. All right. So let, let's finish up. Let's use a couple of, of other tools to look at other information about the processes on the system, right? So um, we talked about one of the things that the process had was, was memory, right? Processes have access to memory, and, and, and the operating system is in charge of uh, providing certain guarantees into how that memory, uh, what, what will change that memory and what won't change that memory. We'll come back to that as we go throughout the class. But there's this new tool called PMAP that I actually, when I started writing the slides for this class, didn't really know about. But PMAP will show you um, for a process what the memory, what, sort of what parts of memory it has mapped, right? So this is again for Bash, right, which is small and sort of simple, okay? So I, I ran PMAP. Let's see, I didn't, I didn't do this cleverly. And here, here's what I found for Bash, right? So who can help start explaining this output? Let's start, let's see here. I haven't picked down people over here. What, what, what's your name? Wee Kyung. What do you think, what is, so what's this? I have my little laser thing. I hate this thing. Right? What are these? 
That's the PID. Who thinks that's a PID? It's a little big to be a PID. What else might that be? It, what's her name? Arish. Memory address, right? These are memory addresses. It's a 32-bit machine, right? So this is on the low end, right? These are eight, these are hex addresses. They're eight nibbles, I think they're actually called, wide. Um, and yeah, I think nibble is, is, is four bits, right? And then wh what are these, right? Are these, th these also look like memory addresses. What's the largest memory address on a 32-bit on a machine? About 32 bits. Yeah, but <laughs> what would it look like here? It's, it's easier than that, right? In, in what would it look like here in this format? All Fs. What's your name? Uh, Shabma. Shabma. All Fs, right? Um, so, so, ba so, okay, so this is how bash, these are memory addresses, right? And then what, uh, what's, what's here, right? What are these? What's, what's your name? Do you go by Wembley? Wembley, Wembley it's a great name. What, what, what are those? How much of the code is loaded into memory? Yeah, well, that's actually, I think, the size of the region, right? So, so these regions have different semantics according to, to the kernel. The kernel is going to kind of handle them or protect them differently, right? Um, so, for example, this is 876K of something, right, that's been loaded into Bash's address space. Um, what do, how many, if you've used Unix before, what do these look like? They look like permission bits. What's your name? Amit. Amit. So these look like, yeah, standard sort of Linux permission bits, right? And what do, you, what do you think they indicate about that memory region? So this is a good one, for example, right? This is 876K of something that's marked R and X. What do you think that means? So, so R, W, and X do stand for those things. What's marked here? Yeah, so what, what does that mean? Yeah, so this is a portion of memory that Bash is allowed to read from, right? Which is kind of required to execute, right? It'd be difficult to execute something if you couldn't read it. And it's allowed to execute it. So what, what do you think is potentially loaded here? Code this is the code section, right? And then this last thing over here, right, what is this? What does that look like? What's that? Yeah, it's, it's, oh, it's a path, right? It's a path to what? To an executable file, right? And, and what, what do you, how, so how do we interpret this all together, right? So I have a path, I have some permissions, I have size, and then I have this memory address. Who can sort of put together all the pieces for me? So there is an executable file, yep. which is 876k, which is readable and exe executable. And it starts from the memory address 08. Uh, that's almost perfect, right? So what this means is that there is 876k of code that was loaded from this file, right? You'll see that this file is indicated several times, right? There's a few other regions that were also loaded from this file. There is 876k of code that was loaded from this file at this memory address and, and marked readable and executable, right? So again, this is probably the bulk of the code that's being used by Bash, right? What about these other two, um, these other two areas that Bash has loaded, right? What, what do we think those are? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's a segment that's marked just R, right? So that's a static segment. OK, so what do we, what do we mean by that? What do you think of it? Static, but what's in there? It was loaded from bin bash, right? We know that. That's where it came from. What do, what do programs have that they would load? What's that? Global okay, global, global variables, that's good, but global variables that what? Constant. Yeah, constants. Constants, right? This is important. Not configuration things, because configuration things I might have to load from another file, those could change, right? Constants related to its operation, right? And then what about this, uh, what about this area? I, I should not even sure what this is. <laughs> <laughs> So this, this is, well, actually, no, I, no, I am sure what that is. Sorry. Um, I don't know what those other things are, though. OK, so wh what do you think this is? This RW. So it's an RW section also loaded from bin bash, right? Yeah. 
This is this is data section in the code, but it's it's data that's been initialized from the file, right? <laughs> so when Bash starts up, there's a certain part of its data that it's going to change, but it loads some initial values into, right? So if you program if you programmed in C and everybody will be programming in C, when you initialize a, st a variable inside your code, right, that's not dynamically allocated and it's not on your stack. It's just, you know, like a, a global variable that's going to be used throughout the code. And you initialize it. This is how it works, right? Whatever val values you initialize, it get loaded into the executable. And this is how it gets set up at runtime. All right? Any questions about the memory mapping stuff here? OK, what's this stuff down here? Yeah, these are libraries, right? So, so Bash uses, you know, a uh, lot libc, right? This is the standard C library. If you programmed in C, you've used libc, you don't even know it, right? You don't have to do much to use libc, and it's difficult to do anything in C without using libc, right? Libc is like string length and all sorts of like really standard utility stuff. It also provides the standard wrappers to the Unix system calls, right? So almost everything in C uses libc. Yeah? Um, I was if all of the C are just one file, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, oh man, this, this goes down a long, messy road that I don't want to, I don't want to go down too far. But um, the the format of, and actually, you guys will deal with this in assignment too, right? The format of, so there's a standard, there's something called ELF, right? Does anyone know what ELF stands for? Other than a small person who helps Santa, <laughs> no, you can't answer your, <laughs> yeah. Just like the compiled Linux file, uh, Close. I think it's executable and linking format, right? So when you, like, when, so the idea is that bin bash is a file that's produced by the compiler, but is going to be interpreted by the operating system. And so they have to agree on a format. And there's something called ELF, which is complicated and well documented and everything. But what ELF does is ELF tells the compiler how to produce a file that the operating system can understand. So when the operating system loads bash, it reads the file according to the ELF format, and what it finds out is there's 876k of code that Bash wants loaded here, right? And then there's 4k of, of um, initialized global variables, read-only variables, static variables that it wants put here, et cetera, et cetera, right? We'll get back to this when we talk about exec, right? But essentially, bin Bash contains, it's almost like, um, how many people know about celebrities? Nobody? Well, come on, admit it. I, even I know about celebrities, OK? This is ridiculous. Everyone knows about celebrities, right? So the, the, I don't know. I just find this funny. Like Some of these like rock stars and stuff like that, they have these things in their contract where um, I can't remember who it was. I shouldn't impugn anybody unfairly. But you know, maybe some like famous pop singer diva who I don't want to get their name wrong you know, only wants green and red M&Ms in the candy jar in her dressing room. Right? There has to be a bowl of M&Ms there, but there can only be green and red M&Ms. So somebody at the venue has to go through the M&Ms and pick out all the blue ones and the yellow ones and all the colors that, that would make this person very unhappy. Right? That's kind of like what ELF is like. Right? ELF is a description of exactly how the process wants to find things when it starts running. Right? And it's very specific, exactly like, I don't want any blue M&Ms. Right? So again, we'll come back to that. It's a great example. All right. And then what's down here? What, is this, what does this indicate? And this is pretty obvious. The answer is on the slide. Yeah. It's the stack, right? So that's where you know, a, a Bash is saving um, you know, variables that are local to each thread, right? And thread state associated with, with run. Okay. All right. So now, again, we can fill in a bit more pieces of our, um, of our address space. Hold on. Did, was there a heap here? Oh, yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. OK. Um, is that actually true? Yeah, I think it is. So what about this? So these are interesting, right? This is a fair amount, right? It's like for Bash, right? Like two megs. You know, Bash is a little teeny weeny, little nice program um, of stuff that's marked anon. What is that? What are, what are we missing here, right? We've got our stack. We have libraries. We have the code for executable. You need a heap, right? Need somewhere to put dynamically initialized stuff. So that's what, that's what this section is, right? So we can fill this in. So now we have our code, we have our data, we have a section for the heap, right? 
and we have this area for our stack. Okay. Finally, I know this is long. This is again <laughs> long-winded and dull. Um, yeah, question. Because it's, I mean, it, it didn't come from a file, right? And, and it's just, that's, that's a good question, actually. I don't know why that, that term is used here, right? But yeah, good, 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 good question. I actually don't know why PMAP outputs a non for that, right? Instead of heap or something else, right? There, there might be cases where I can, well, actually, there might be cases where I, I might have areas of my address space that it doesn't know what they are for, right? So they might be like memory map files or other things, right? So, so it's possible that it wouldn't put heap because it's too specific, right? But some of that is definitely in use for the heap. That, that I'm sure of. All right. OK, so finally, there's this nice command called lsof that will show you open files for your process, right? So this is bash, right? And um, you'll see that it shows a couple. What are, what are these? Does anybody, any, any of the Linux hackers out there know what these are? Yeah. Yeah, the terminals, right? So bash is a terminal client, and so it it's, it's has a couple terminal sockets open, right? And then what's that last file down there? Yeah, I'm going to say, I need to get to the core. Bash RC, what do you think that is? <laughs> is that the executable? So it's in my home directory. Right? And it's not bin bash. Yeah, what's your name? Don. Don. Yeah, thanks. User profile, right? So I've got my settings in there, and, and bash has that open, right? <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Yeah, OK. So, so that's actually not true, right? This file wasn't actually open. When I ran this command uh, for real, all that was open was the terminals. But I wanted to have like a real file, so I just stole that in there. But, you know, um, but let's just pretend that I caught bash right when it started up. And it was actually reading my, uh, reading my, reading my file. Right. OK, any questions about this? Right. So we've, we've shown that you can use these standard Linux tools to, to basically build up this really nice and complete picture of what a process is like. And, and this, is, this is essentially all there is as far as we're concerned. Right? What, are we, what are we missing here? Right? What's, what's the one big thing that would, if this was all a process was today, what, what would you be very disappointed by? What's missing here, right? I've got files, I've got some memory, I have a, a thread running. What can I not do that you might do with your computer normally? Anyone take a guess? No guesses? Well, okay, well that would that would help, right? But but what like <laughs> Do you consider pockets of a file? No, I don't, right? Yeah, like, had anyone here do any networking on their computer? Come on, Kai. This is an exercise in, in hand raising, right? I mean, I, I don't even open up my computer if I can't get on the internet, right? It's not interesting, right? So if, if, if there was no networking, this, this would be, this, you know, you, you'd be sad. And this doesn't really include networking, right? Uh, but, but again, we're going to pretend that it's 1970, right? Maybe I'll ask you guys to dress like it's 1970 one day. Maybe I'll start dressing like it's 1970. Maybe I already dressed like it's 1970. Who knows? I don't know. I wasn't alive in 19. I was. I barely made it into the 70s, 79. So I'm proud of that. Right? Didn't know I was not born in the 80s. That's just barely. All right. Um, last thing I want to point out is just a, a little bit of sort of uh, interesting um, sort of uh, information about operating systems, about how operating systems expose information. So um, th the question is, how do all these utilities get this information, right? Um, these utilities are, are helpful tools right, for system administrators and other people who are interested in finding out things about their, their system. Right? And so the operating system kernel is you know, Linux and other operating systems try to expose some of this information for these tools to use in a kind of flexible and nice way. Right? And what Linux does is kind of clever. It, it essentially reuses the file abstraction. Right? So if you go. On a, on a Linux or you know, Unix system, usually there's a, there's a file system called proc. It's usually mounted in, in uh, slash proc. And so this is, the, this is the mount for the proc file system. When I go into proc and I run ls, so I, I went into proc and I ran ls in a particular proc directory, and it shows me all these files. right? 
These are not actual files. Okay? What is happening is the, the operating system is, ma is maintaining this illusion of a file system here, right, for the benefit of these utilities, right? But when I do an ls in this directory, what happens is the operating system says, oh, you know, what's all the information I should know about process 7615? And it, it displays it as files. So reading and writing, usually you really can't write to proc, right? But uh, sometimes you can, but, but reading from proc essentially routes you into the kernel and retrieves information about the processes, but there is no actual file system, right? Anyway, that was just a... All right, so let me, uh, let's go back to Friday and today and, and do a little bit of review, all right? So this is kind of what we've talked about so far, right? So we have, uh, we gave you sort of an introduction into some of the operating system abstractions we'll be covering for the rest of the term, right? Threads abstracting the CPU, um, address spaces that abstract memory, files that abstract uh, disk blocks, essentially. Um, and we started to talk about processes which kind of organize and bring together some of these other abstractions, right? Um, all right, so, but why do, we, why do we even have these abstractions in the first place, right? Who can, who can remind me why operating systems go to all this effort to create and maintain these abstractions? Right? What do abstractions do? Three things. Let's see here. One of them. Yeah, they, well, they hide complexity, right? Well, what is complexity an example of? What is com uh, like complexity is, is sometimes a, a member of a broader class, which I might call what? Yeah, not the implementation. Yeah, make it simple by what, right? What do I do to make something simple? I hide, okay, we're getting closer. Hi, well, it's up, it's up on the slides, right? Hiding what, right? Uh, it's going to hide the implementation, but what? Policy and yeah, okay, now, no, no, no. What's that? Undesirable properties. Oh, crap. Everything came up once, right? <laughs> All right, pretend you didn't see that. My slides surprise me sometimes. I, I wish I'd done this better. Um, OK, hiding undesirable properties, right? Complexity is an example of an undesirable property. The implementation is an example of an undesirable property, because when the implementation changes, I don't want to have to recompile every one of my programs, right? So just, or, or you know, when I get a new hard drive and stick it in my machine, I don't have to re want to recompile every one of my programs, right? So, Implementation, how things actually work, is, is considered by the operating system to be an undesirable feature, right? And, and something that, that processes and applications should not have to know about, right? Adding what? what is, so what do abstractions also do? They add what and they organize what? Adding capabilities. capabilities, right? Things that, and again, this is, kind of, this is kind of hiding undesirable features, but it goes past that, right? It says, hey, as long as I'm doing all this work, why don't I make things better, right? You know, I, so I create this file abstraction so I don't have to worry about disk blocks, but let's make the file abstraction do some cool things that disk blocks don't do, right? Like maybe be reliable and perform better and, you know, be able to grow and shrink dynamically, whatever, right? I mean, you know, it's adding new features, right, by using these, these underlying capabilities. And then finally, organizing what? Information. Information, right? All right. So, and, and the purpose of all this is to simplify life for applications, right? And also to allow the underlying hardware to change without having to, to, to change your applications, right? I mean, you guys don't really appreciate this, but, but back when computers, before some of these abstractions existed, you didn't just get new computer hardware, right? Like, your program might have been heavily, you know, so, it, it, you know, and this is, prehistoric times, but it used to be you wrote a program for a particular computer, right? And if something about that computer changed, you had to rewrite your program, right? Like you made assumptions about, um, you know, the, the, the capabilities in the machine, and if that capabilities changed, then your programs broke, right? My favorite example of this. How many people have ever seen a computer with a turbo button on it? All right. And if you, all the Linux geeks here and who know why this is can't, can't tell people. So, so they're, they're, uh, they're, these used to exist when I was growing up, right? You'd see these computers and kind of old, like X, early x86 machines, and they had a turbo button, right? It was usually on the front of the case, you know, and it had a little lead on it. You hit it, and it was like turbo mode, right? 
So why would your, uh, why would your computer have a turbo button, right? Don't I want it to be in turbo mode all the time? Why did these machines have a turbo button? You know, so the turbo button increased the speed of the processor, right? But again, why do, why, like, why not run in turbo mode all the time? No, it had nothing to do with resource consumption. These machines were slow, slow. So it's like, I'm going to make it a little bit faster. No, no, no. <laughs> None of the, let's, well, actually, Sean, you want to go? It was, not, it was not heat. As far as I know, these machines would run in turbo mode happily for as long as you wanted them to. Yeah, Gina. Not power consumption. Oh, this is back. Energy is cheap. It's like 1960. You know, like nuclear power is going to save everything. You know, like there's so much oil underground. Like no one cared about it. Well, maybe they did, but any other guesses? Yeah. What's your name? Anurag. No. Well, it had nothing to do with memory. What it, okay. <laughs> I don't know. We should, just, we should just give it away. But um, So one of the things that people used to use their PCs for was to play games, right? Like early computer games, you know, different types of things where you know, I'd be running around in some little virtual world, right? So why? So I, I just gave you a hint. Right? And we'll speculate about this for a few more minutes, for like a 30 more seconds, right? What, what to do with games might mean that I would want to have a turbo button. Well, I could, but, but again, why wouldn't I run, want it to run faster all the time? Nick? No, it wasn't an extra input source. Could, No, no, no. Yeah, you, okay. So you guys are, it's funny, you guys are making the assumption that I would use turbo mode when I was playing a game. Try making the other assumption. Yeah. It would go too fast. You had these games that made assumptions about the speed of the processor, and they used those assumptions to dictate how the game worked and how fast the game worked, right? So imagine, like, you've got a new computer, right? You're, I don't know, who, what's a popular computer game? World of Warcraft. How many people play World of Warcraft? Good, because you're going to fail. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> you won't have any time left to do the class. No, no anyway. And so, it's, OK, World of Warcraft. But apparently, it's not a popular game. Only Sean plays it, all right? <laughs> all right, Angry Birds, right? So imagine you got a new phone. And suddenly, Angry Birds was like, <laughs> it was just like super fast, right? Can't, can't be that way, OK? So, but this is an example of you know, when, when application developers made these assumptions about the machine, and then those assumptions changed. It's like, we'll never have a faster processor. It's like, oh, of course we will. Like, just wait 30 seconds. Yeah, the other question? I was saying, I've ran into that problem before. I was playing a game from like 2000 that made those kinds of assumptions. Uh -huh. I was moving like five times faster than I could have. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I mean, maybe they thought that people's reflexes were going to scale with Moore's Law. Right? <laughs> that would be awesome. Right? It'd be like the Matrix, you know? It's like, download my helicopter. Uh, that's pretty cool. All right. Anyway, so that's a little fun aside. Okay. So what do what do processes? Uh, this, this is like Jeopardy or something, or not Jeopardy? Um, Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> okay. Processes organize organize information about what and represent a single thing that the computer is what. What does a process do? Processes organize information about what. Not a trick question. Yeah, Jen. All right, information. Oh, okay. So they do collect multiple abstractions together. And uh, other, oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, she got it. All right, and represent a single thing the computer is doing, right? And we talked about what processes contain: threads, address spaces, file handles. All right. IPC mechanisms. I'm going to start to speed up a little bit here because I don't feel like I have the room. Remember, IPC mechanisms. What does IPC stand for? Is it up on the, it is. It's up on the slide. OK, that's good. Inter process communication. Yeah, it's fun. Return codes. That's a, yeah, that's a great one. Nice and easy. Just return, return a number. What happened to me? Um, what else? Pipes, yeah. Signals, yeah, errors. That's interesting. Yeah, errors would probably return to return codes primarily. But pipes, signals, return codes. We're, yeah, we're pretty close. 
files. Files are another poor man's version of IPC. I can certainly share a file between processes. And shared memory, which we haven't really talked about. All right. One major goal of the operating system. At, at minimum, what would I like my operating system to do? Other, other than all these other great things, right? For, for processes, right? What's that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, but what's that a broader class of? Terminating other processes is an example of what? So, if, yeah, okay, so, well, it's difficult to protect processes against race conditions. It's usually programmer <laughs> problems. But I'm, I'm a process, I'm going along, and somebody terminate, terminates me, right? That would be mean, right? But what else would I not like to happen? Molested, Molested right? That's the, that's the word I've been using. <laughs> Maybe it's not a great word to use in, in class. But, yeah, from, from molestation, right? From, uh, from, from having someone picking on me, right? I, I, you know, it's a little... Tell Bash to leave me alone, you know? Like, he keeps writing into my address space. It's like kids, right? I'm going to put you over there in your corner and, and put him in his corner. Okay. Um, all right, we just talked about this. Okay. All right, questions now before we start talking about Fork, which, of course, we will not finish today. But. All right. So one thing we need to do before we start talking about process creation, and this will, this will be good because I think we'll get through this and then that will be it for today, is talk about our process model, right? So this is the model of processes that we had developed last time. We have threads. Uh, we have an address space with different parts of it that are mapped. And this will all, th this is like, this is probably for some of you kind of like looking at hieroglyphics right now, right? But um, I will, we, I am teaching you hieroglyphics. <laughs> so by the end of the semester, hopefully all of this will be clear, right? Um, but they're still, I don't know, they're still kind of pretty to look at, even if you know what you're looking at. Um, okay, so, so here's, but this was our process model. We had files, and we had this idea of um, the, you know, basically processes just having some pointer to a file, right? And what we want to do before we talk about fork, because fork has some important semantics related to file tables that you guys will have to understand for, for, the, for the second assignment, is introduce an additional level of abstraction, right? So we had this idea of file handles. How many people have, have used you know, open, read, write, and C, and, and done file I.O. that way, right? OK, what, what is a file? Well, let's just review here. What is a file handle for a C process? What's that? It's, uh, OK, it's a pointer to a file. That's what it is conceptually. But what, what is it if you're a C program and you're just using it? Like, you call open, and open hands back what? An int, just an int. That's all it is. Right? It's just a number, right? It's like, that's how you talk about files, right? You don't give the full path to the operating system every time you need to perform an operation. You just give it a number, right? It's, a, it's an optimization, right? So essentially, when I open my slides file, the operating system will say, you can call this file 3, right? And that's what we'll agree on for the lifetime of the process, right? And then next time, I, when I want to write something, I say, hey, OS, I would like to write to file 3. Right? And the operating system will, will, will do the path mapping for me. Right? OK, and, and again, this is kind of what, what this is designed to reflect. Right? So I have a process that have a file table. Right? The, the files are actually stored in an array within the process. There's usually a limit to the number of processes, files that a process can have open. Um, this is a, one of those cases where limits are very nice. Right? So, um, well. Anyway, there's been too many digressions today already, so I won't, I won't go there. Um, so I'm, I'm introducing a new level of interaction. So I have a file table, right? And the int that I talked about in my file table now points to this file handle, right? Which is an operating system object that has some other information about the file. And then that actually points to the file itself, right? So now I have two levels of interaction, right? The operating system first translates my, uh, I need to, like the, the, the actual int that I'm given, right? To, to this file handle, and then that is translated to a file, right? Right, so again, we just talked about this, right? So the, the int refers to a file handle object that's maintained by the kernel, right? And that file handle object also references a separate file object that's maintained by the kernel of the file system, so, right? Um, so now we have three levels of interaction. We have file descriptor to file handle, file handle, file object, and file object finally to some disk blocks, right? So why am I... Why, why, why did I do this, right? Why am I, um, 
Why did I introduce this, this additional level of, of indirection? Do people understand what happened here, right? What happened here is that I, I took one thing and I split it into two pieces, right? And I have the first piece pointing to the second piece, right? So I had, you know, this, and I've split part of that information, and I have a file table, and now the file handle is maintained by the kernel, right? But why would I do this, right? Why, why, why would I? Where's, what's, what's, the, what's the normal case where I would take one piece of information and divide it into two parts? What's that? Better file management. Mm, better, I mean, that, that might be the overall goal. Another layer of abstraction to hide what's actually on those boxes. Yeah, well, I already had the abstraction in place to hide that undesirable feature being that there are actual disk blocks, right? Too much of information. To save memory. Mm. When I thought about teaching in this room, I always thought I could walk down these aisles, but it turns out to be more difficult than I anticipated. It's a lot of feet. Um, all right. I'm not, what, what's another reason I might divide something into two pieces? It does, it does create a higher degree of mapping, that's true, but why do I want that? I'll just give away the answer, right? So what I want to do is I want to be able to share different parts of this information differently, right? And protect it differently, right? So one reason of, of taking a single abstraction and breaking it into two pieces is I now can protect each piece differently and have different semantics associated with each piece, right? So, he, so here's how this works. File descriptors are private, right? So we go back to our model here. These file descriptors are private to the process, right? No other process can change my file descriptors, right? And when I open a file, only the file descriptor only exists in my process, right? File handles are private, start out by being private to each process, but are shared after I create a new process, right? So when I create a child, process, which we're going to talk about probably on Friday, those file handles are shared, OK? And the file objects that hold other pieces of file state, those are kernel objects. And those are shared among all the processes, right? So I have stuff that's private to my process, things that are private to my family of processes, right? And then stuff that's shared by every, everybody on the system, right? Before I only had the stuff that's private to my process and stuff that was shared by everybody, right? These kernel objects. And, and, the, and the reason for this um, is something that we're going to talk about when we get to file creation, right? But so there, there are essentially, again, three, three pieces of data now that are shared differently. The file objects are shared across the entire file, entire file system by everybody, all the processes that are, that are using that file. Any process that is, has a certain file open, that will map down into some unique file object maintained by the kernel, right? The file handles are, can be shared by multiple processes, and there's specific semantics for sharing them, right? They're only shared after fork. And the file table is private to each process, right? All right. So before we can talk about exactly why that is, OK, good. I can get through just in the beginning of this. OK. We need to talk about where processes come from. This is like. The birds and the bees conversation that we're going to have now at 9.45 on Wednesday morning. <laughs> All right. So where, where do new processes come from? I mean, they must come from somewhere, right? They're certainly on your computer, you know? Like, <laughs> like oh, man, you know? I, I have a brother and sister, and yet, you know, anyway. Um, and, and me, and, and clearly. Anyway, I won't, I won't finish the joke, but you guys know how it goes. Yeah. OK, so br it's Brian? Yeah. yeah. Brian thinks that processes come from other processes. That's true, right? Um, but let's be a little bit more specific. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's going to be something I control, right? Like, <laughs> there's just too many, uh, there's too many bad analogies here, aren't there? Um, yeah, so I want to be in control of the f uh, process creation process. <laughs> Um, but but what, what else? Like, you know, does anyone, well, okay, so let's talk about this, this like the creation myth, 
right? Where did the first process come from? Yeah, so, so yeah, we could talk about bootstrapping, right? But the first real user process, right? Who knows what this is called on, on Linux systems? Spencer. In it. In it. In it is the first process, right? First, like the kernel, eh, you can think about the kernel as, as, a, as a program, but it's not really a process because, uh, the, you know, it's like, yeah, anyway, I'll, you know, the, the kernel can't be a process because processes are an abstraction created by the kernel, right? So that would, then it would be an abstraction created by itself, right? Which would be difficult to sustain, right? But where does, uh, where does in it come from, right? So I have this process called init. It's the first process on the system. It gives rise to the whole big you know, tree of life of processes that I'm going to have. Where does init come from? What do you think? Um, I'm not sure. Does anybody know? Where does init come Yeah, so the kernel creates the first process, right? So the first process is init, and it's created by the kernel. Right? Maybe not in its own image, but close enough. Right? Um, and, then, and then in it gives birth to all these other processes through this Unix system command that you know, I wish I would have made you guys do, fork. Right? How many people have called fork? All right, good stuff. Yeah, so fork is the Unix system call. This is the, sort of the beginning of our discussion of process lifecycle. Right? So again, there's circularity here, but we're going to start by talking about where processes come from. Right? Other than in it, every process on the system was created by a call to fork. And fork is a unit call, a system call that creates a new process, right? The process that fork creates is a copy of the process that called it. And after fork, we refer to the process that called fork as the parent and the process that was forked as the child. Um, and that, that's fairly obvious why we use the terminology, right? And they, they have a special relationship, right? And, uh, and some special responsibilities with respect to each other, right, that, that we'll talk about, okay? So I start off with my process here, a couple of threads. Um, and, and there's one thing to keep in mind about fork, which, which we, uh, you know, we're, we've, I've tried to update this class a little bit more to make it sort of multi-thread, multi-core compatible. But um, fork tries to make an exact copy of the process that called it, right? Um, and there are lots of different semantics associated with fork. So if you, if you look in Unix and you do man fork or man v fork, you can find out lots of information about different arguments you can give to fork that will call, cause it to do different things, right? Copy this and not that or whatever. But for the purposes of this class, let's consider fork to make it an identical copy of the process that called it, right? With one notable exception, which is that threads are you know, for a variety of reasons, very difficult to make fork safe, right? Because um, imagine, so in a single-threaded process, when the process calls fork, right? So process tells the operating system, hey, I would like to create a new copy of myself, right? And the process actually enters the operating system and starts, starts doing that transformation, right? In a single-threaded process, why is this easy to do? What's not happening in that process at the time it calls fork? Well, it's not that, I mean, there might, you're right, there's more state associated with extra threads that I would have to copy over, but that's not what's difficult, right? When I, when I say to the operating system, hey, I want you to create a copy of me, and there's only one of us that's doing anything inside the operating system, what makes it simpler? If there's only one thread, then it will block. Right, so the idea is that there's some thread, right? So imagine, let me get back to my thread thing, okay. So imagine th thread one was the only thread here, right? And thread one says to the operating system, hey, I want you to fork me, right? Thread one is, is doing that. Thread, has gone off, thread one has gone off to the operating system and said, hey, I want a copy of myself, right? And so nothing else is happening, right? No other threads are running. The process is essentially completely blocked, right? It's frozen in time. It's like if, you know, if you went out to, um, you know, if, if you went out and decided you wanted to make a copy of your house, so you went out to the place that does that, you said, hey, I'd like to do that. I said, okay, you know, wait here while we do that. And then you went home, and there were two copies of your house, and they were identical to the way you left it because there's no one else home, right? 
But let's say you have a family and there's a bunch of other people running around, like these other threads. So now while you're out, they're at home. And when the people come, they're like, well, you know, unless we can shut, stop all of them somehow, which is typically a little bit tricky, right? Stuff's still going on, right? And then the semantics of it are weird, right? Because what fork should do is make a copy of the process at the time that the thread calls fork, right? But if there are other threads in the process, they could still be running and other things could be happening. So it's difficult to say what it should look like afterwards, right? So anyway, we're, we're not going to worry about threads, right? So let's pretend um, on, on Linux, I guess, the semantics are that only the state that called or for the thread that called fork is copied, right? So it's not an exact copy. It's a copy that emits the other threads in the process. And the thread that called fork is responsible for creating those threads if it wants to, all right? Um, yeah, we just went through this, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, this ends up being, being gross, right? All right, so I think this is a good place to stop for today. And on Friday, it's Wednesday, on Friday we will continue talking about fork and file handles and other things. Recitations today, office hours today as scheduled. Go to the web go go to the link I sent you which will open up the Google Calendar. All the office hours are on the Google Calendar. <laughs>